In March 2020, life as we all had come to know it was disrupted and the acceptable state of normalcy was altered indefinitely. The COVID-19 pandemic pushed medical professionals to their absolute limit as they had to learn as much about the coronavirus as possible in a very short space of time while also working flat out to save lives and reduce the infection rate. So as you know, we had the faces of COVID-19 reported in China uh, that's around December 2019 and uh, the number of cases then actually started to increase and to spread uh, around the world, uh, eventually getting to be declared to be what's called a pandemic by the World Health Organization. Uh, that was uh, sometime in March uh, 2020. Uh, Zimbabwe also as a country started recording its first cases of COVID-19 around that time, March 2020. So what is it? It's actually uh, a disease that's caused by a virus uh, that spread uh, from person to person uh, through different means, uh, including, uh, you know, when you get into contact with infected droplets and so on. And so it's uh, been happening around the world uh, in waves. Uh, countries like Zimbabwe have experienced uh, at least three waves, while some countries are actually starting to experience the, the fourth wave. And uh, these epidemic waves, as we know, are likely to be continuing for quite some time. And uh, in terms of what it actually does, it causes a respiratory illness, but it can also complicate uh, into, into other systems. And uh, from time to time, it actually causes people to die. The loss of life has left huge dents in numerous departments. How has this impacted industry and the chain of production? In my view, the biggest burden has been that COVID came to us when we were not in perfect health as an economy. Uh, so clearly, it, w it, was, uh, it was really going to have a very significant impact on the economy. If you compare with how other economies uh, were affected by COVID, you then want to say, if it affected them that bad, how about the Zimbabwean economy, which itself was not in perfect, in what I would call perfect health, uh, before COVID came. So the major areas of impact, um, I think top of the list for me is the loss of human life, um, which is really loss of our loved ones, our family, friends, and others, but also looking at the loss of human life from a human capital perspective because uh, we did lose uh, quite uh, a number of um, of professionals to COVID across all the sectors. The medical fraternity lost, uh, lost people, um, the various other sectors of the economy lost people, we lost executives, we lost uh, uh, operational staff, we lost a lot of people. So for me that is top, that is the biggest, biggest uh, loss because recovering from that is difficult. Um, the other area of impact has been the disruption of supply chains uh, where you know uh, the importation of goods you understand that uh, the Zimbabwean economy is, uh, is, is, is reliant on imports uh, for, uh, for manufacturing, for our agriculture sector and even for the operations in the mining sector um, and the disruption of those supply chains uh, came with significant impact uh, to those uh, particular sectors. Um, and the other area of impact was the reduction of aggregate demand due to the, uh, to the lockdowns because, uh, you know, in, in, in trying to address COVID and control it, the government had to institute measures which included total lockdowns and that meant economic activity uh, was brought to a complete, uh, to a complete halt. But, you know, as with any crisis, they say you should never waste a crisis. I would say that uh, we have also seen with the, uh, with the disruption of supply chains 
a bigger dependence on local supply chains, you know. So we have seen a bit of a boost in local production um, responding to that and maybe a recovery of some of the market space that had been occupied by imported goods. Um, so there are two sides to that, but it has also caused us to reflect uh, on our own resilience, uh, on how we need to deepen our value chains and how we need to be more and more self-reliant uh, as an economy. Um, how can we localize a lot of the capacities that we require uh, to drive the economy? The pandemic left people at their wit's end as to how best they could go by. With very few resources, small to medium entrepreneurs have adhered to protocol and ensured sanitization of walk-in customers, as well as the meter apart social distancing. In Zimbabwe, most people make their earnings daily and the lockdowns and spread of infection put an abrupt end to this. Unfortunately, in an already impoverished country, people have had no choice but to dip into their we, savings for sustenance. We have been like staying indoors and our survival has been um, uh, surviving through our savings uh, using what we had saved for other purposes just so that we survive uh, with the kids, um, food-wise, um, just to meet day-to-day -day demands from our uh, savings. The greater part of the Zimbabwean population makes a living off of earnings made through the informal sector. Having noted this, some organizations have made it their business to ensure that some target groups within the sector receive fair treatment from the government as they too are active contributors to the economy. VSET is a union of informal traders um, with uh, structures throughout the country. Uh, we drive our mandate from informal traders uh, who constitute the majority of the population in the country. Um, and the organization was formed um, in 2015 uh, to provide a solidarity platform for informal traders who continue to face a lot of challenges as a result of policies that are not uh, supportive. The government um, uh, did not do much in terms of uh, you know, responding to the pandemic. I'll talk from the perspective of the informal economy. Um, as you may be aware, uh, when the initial lockdown was pronounced by the government, we were told that uh, there was going to be a cushioning fund you know, to support uh, those that are vulnerable uh, because the lockdown meant that people were unable to, to do trade, to move from one uh, place to the other. And this also affected the informal, uh, the informal sector. Uh, we expected the government to come in and support the vulnerable, including uh, our members, uh, uh, the informal traders. We, we were told that there was a cushioning facility that was set aside, but up to now, no one has benefited from that, uh, from that facility. If there was a need for the government to be prompted to view the informal sector as a worthy contributing entity to the economy, this begs the question, how much did the government do to help during the pandemic? And who is responsible for accounting for the funds allocated to relief programs? To this day, no stone remains unturned as governments, organizations, families and individuals suffered damaging blows on account of the virus. There is a gaping hole that needs to be covered in the post-COVID era, and this may take years. How were operations in Zimbabwean industries affected by the pandemic? With a sudden push for self-reliance as a country, can we conclude then that the government recognized the motor industry and offered adequate assistance that helped the industry to stay oh, afloat? COVID-19 has been a pandemic surely for everyone, like it is or like it came, but uh, we've been affected by the lockdowns, we've been affected by the deaths of our close ones, we've been affected by the illness of everyone generally, but we are soldiering on. The on the way government authorities handled the, the pandemic are not really happy. It's just a matter of uh, suffering and suffering. Otherwise, there's no assistance I got directly or even to my close friends or in my community that I saw besides the one I said. Otherwise, I'm urging government to do more if, if the pandemic continues. As it stands so far, 
The people have expressed deep disgruntlement as they do not feel the government has done enough to assist them on many different levels. Before COVID, people were left to fend for themselves in various sectors, while the government continued to make promises of a better day. In light of this, has the health department been able to pull resources together? When you look at Zimbabwe, in terms of the responses that we've had since uh, March 2020, when we had the first cases uh, of COVID-19 uh, responded in the country, uh, we have had a very good response. Uh, and how did we respond to that? Uh, Zimbabwe actually uh, formed groups uh, to look at COVID that are divided into what we call pillars. And we actually do have eight pillars across uh, the country from the Ministry of uh, health going down to uh, district levels and provincial hospitals, provincial levels, and where we work uh, with uh, various developmental partners, which we call NGOs, and with support uh, from the World Health Organization. I think the country has yet a very good uh, and well-coordinated response since the beginning of the uh, outbreak in Zimbabwe, which has managed us to uh, to put uh, under control to a large extent and we have actually managed to limit the damage from uh, COVID-19. If we had not, it could actually have been much worse. So I guess we all have to agree that Zimbabwe is uh, going under very uh, sort of tough economic conditions now. And so when we look at the resources uh, allocated to the COVID-19 responses, I wouldn't say they have been enough. Actually, I think they have been suboptimal. And that's in terms of financial resources, that's in terms of human resources, uh, that's in terms of material resources and other consumables that are needed. We have yet uh, gross shortages of things that we need to use in the control of COVID-19, including uh, the testing kits itself, including places for treating these patients, beds for admission, oxygen supplies, gloves and other consumables, even what we call the personal protective equipment. So uh, these have not been enough, but we still do commend uh, the efforts that the government has been putting uh, in trying to uh, provide these uh, to the healthcare workers in particular. And of course, I think we should uh, actually commend the fact that we have had uh, tremendous support uh, from non-governmental organizations, developmental partners and uh, implementing partners uh, we have supported uh, the responses in terms of provision of personal protective equipment, uh, in terms of supplies of consumables such as oxygen and other things that are needed, and also in terms of even uh, supporting responses such as surveillance, uh, testing, uh, case management and so on. I think the World Health Organization in particular has done a tremendous job in supporting the responses. The Ministry of Health has been on its knees for years, with public hospitals being unable to offer basic treatment to patients. Over the last two years, nurses have been calling for favorable salary adjustments and sanitary working environments. Now in the face of the deadly pandemic, how did the Ministry of Health and Child Care respond to the inadequacies being confronted? During an interview on the Mint, the Finance Minister, Professor Mtuding Ngube, had the opportunity to explain how funds are going to be allocated after the state received 961 million US dollars from the IMF. Let's, let's go back to the health sector. The health sector, we're going to do basically three things. The first thing is there'll be resources allocated for acquisition of more vaccines. Because we may go into fourth wave, who knows? And we have to keep, it, you know, uh, make sure that there is enough vaccines for, for more jabs. Vaccine, you know, we? Yeah, so we, exactly. yeah, we currently have 13 million, that including donations, that, that, uh, and we have got another 7 million to go. So, so, so there's more coming, but we may go beyond that. So one adequate resources to acquire more vaccines. We've done very well so far, in, in fact. So that's the first thing under health. The second thing under health, health is to keep upgrading our central hospitals in the main, and some hospitals and in, in health infrastructure, which has been slow to, to, to be completed. Or, throughout which is, the entire country. Exactly, we're very serious about that. Upgrade our infrastructure. Then number three is to equip these hospitals. So, so that's, that's health. Zimbabwe is a country that takes great pride in its high rate of literacy that has continued to increase steadily since the country's independence in 1980. The education department has managed to hold its own, but not without any challenges.
it has been hard but um, I've tried to follow all the protocols and to stay safe and prevent myself from getting the COVID-19. It has really affected me especially as a student in terms of learning we shifted from face-to-face -face lectures to online which was a struggle but uh, we managed to pull through and yeah Uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic actually uh, came at a time when our government was not actually prepared and didn't have a clue in terms of how to deal with the such nature of a pandemic. And uh, it shows that there was a lack of uh, preparedness, especially in terms of, uh, of emergencies. Because at the end of the day, um, uh, issues to do with learning, especially from a point of view that I'm coming in from the education field, uh, should have been uh, should have been actually been help should have been uh, ongoing uh, if with uh, measures that have already been put in place uh, on in terms of how to deal with images. Now, education, we want to uh, do something that's very important, and it matters a lot in rural areas, whether there is a, a high school boarding school or not, it matters a lot. Mm. Because you don't want poor kids in the rural areas to be walking to school, mm. and they're going back home, there's poor infrastructure Even at home in terms school. of learning. Mm. They need to move to some boarding school. Yes, it can get expensive, parents can't afford it, but that's another matter for discussion another day. First of all, let's build boarding schools. So one, one, one idea that we have proposal is that let's build one boarding school, high school per province. Mm -hmm. We have eight rural provinces, eight. The other two, Hararimbla, Eben. So let's build eight uh, uh, rural boarding schools at high school level. But, but let, let me in areas start. such as, for instance, mm -hmm. Matmat South, there, there aren't enough uh, uh, boarding schools there. Mm -hmm. Mashmal Mash, and Central are, are the same. What has happened in the last 40 years is that we've got some boarding schools, but these are mainly owned by churches and not by government. We're saying government must have skin in the game and invest. Then equip, equip these schools as well. Make sure there's power mm. so that we can deliver, you know, uh, uh, you know use ICT for, for mm. IT support for learning purposes. But, but Make sure there's also water. Uh, but you say boarding schools, but I mean, why not just build normal schools, normal classrooms, upgrade the existing classrooms that are there and put more schools in the various areas? Why, why boarding schools in particular? Yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't mm. sp spending money on new classrooms, etc., have give you more bang but for your buck? Our so research has shown that the, that's where the shoe pinches as well, because kids may have to walk long distances and so forth. So if we, we target that specifically and do it, build those boarding schools, high schools mm. in the areas where they need to just do it, mm. we will, that, 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 that will have a lot of impact. Of course, we have other resources. We, we, we have already allocated money to the Minister of uh, This is over primary. and above what this you've is already budgeted. This is an addition what we've already budgeted. Mm -hmm. And everything is in addition to what we've already budgeted. Okay. Right. So that's, that's, that's the education sector. That's, that's our thinking. We, of course, we may, might fine-tune that. There might be pushback. We, we're listening. Government will listen and fine-tune. But that's our thinking for the moment. Mm -hmm. Scandal. Looting, neglect, unprepared, loss. These are the words we continue to hear from people when they speak on government response to the pandemic. In a country where people ask for nothing more than their basic rights to be met, while the government makes promises nonstop, the question still stands, how far must the country fall into disarray before we start to get answers from the government?